Hi there. I'm Engelbert Maloloy, Bicol University. Decimal fractions were rather a bore at school, but there are some interesting relations and principles governing them. Let us review some of the elementary ones. Let's refer to them as decimal fractions. So we have one third, one fourth, one fifth, one over six, one over seven, one over nine. and 1 over 11. Why do some of the decimals terminate without a remainders? Others repeat the first digit indefinitely. Some repeat after the similar digit preceding them, and still others have digits repeating in cycles. Most of you are probably aware of the fact in order for the re reciprocal of an integer to terminate when expressed as decimal, to come out exactly, so to speak, it, it is necessary that the integer consists only of powers of 2 or 5 or both. Numbers such as 2, 4, 5, Eight, ten, sixteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty-two, forty, fifty, sixty-four, eighty, one hundred. To mention all those not exceeding one hundred consists only of powers of two and five, and therefore their reciprocals are terminate decimals. It is the behavior of those other integers which furnishes the creational aspects of decimals. To understand about the cycle of repetition, it is convenient to think of power of 10 divided by the given integer. Thus, the reciprocal of the integer 7, we think of 10 raised to x divided by 7. Now, by Fermat's theorem, Fermat's theorem, we have ten raised to p minus one is congruent to one modulo p. That is, we need to raise ten to an exponent no higher than p minus one before the remainder becomes one when divided by a prime p. Sometimes the exponent may be a smaller number. If so, the smallest of such the smallest such exponent is always uh, a part of p minus one, or a factor of p minus one rather. If ten raised to a is congruent to one modulo p, where a is the smallest exponent, that gives one as the remainder. Let me write that one. The number e represents the number of decimal places that the reciprocal of p must be carried to before it repeats. So by Fermat's theorem, 10 squared is congruent to 1 modulo 3. But the lower exponent 1 also applies. So it follows also that 10 raised to 1 is congruent to 1 modulo 3. Hence, 1 over 3 should repeat after only one digit. In fact, 1 over 3, as we have shown previously, is 0.33 repeating. Similarly, 10 raised to 6 is congruent to 1 modulo 7. But in this case, the congruence would hold for no lower exponent than 6. Therefore, there must be six places in the period of 1 over 7. And indeed, 
1 over 7 is equal to 1, 4, 2, 8, 5, 7 ad infinitum. Repetition of the cycle takes place when the remainder 1 is reached because the division by 7 start, started with unity as the first digit in the dividend. Allow me to expand on the decimal representation of 1 over 7 in relation to modulo. So if you will have 10 raised to 1, that's congruent to 3 modulo 7. Um, maybe we can show first the, the long division before we continue this one. So if we take a look at 1 over 7, so we add a 0 after the decimal point. So we take up this as 10 divided by 7. We have 1. So we have 1 times 7 is 7. So remainder is 3. We can add 0 as we please to continue the division process. So 30 divided by 7 is, is 4. So 4 times 7 is 28. So 30 minus 28 is 2. Bring down 0 again. 20 divided by 7 is, is 2. So 2 times 7 is 14. 20 minus 14 is 6. Bring down 0. 60 divided by 7 is 5. 5 times 7 is, is 8 rather. So 8 times 7 is 56. So 56. Uh, 60 minus 56 is 4. So we bring down 0. 40 divided by 7 is 5. So 5 times 7 is 35. So 40 minus 35 is uh, 5. 50 divided by 7 is 7. 7 times 7 is 49 that brings us back to a remainder of 1. So notice that if we divide 10 by 7, the remainder is 3. Whereas if we divide 100, 10 squared by 7, the remainder would be, would be 2, modulo 7. Divide 1,000 by 7, the remainder is actually 6. Divide 10 raised to 4 by 7, the remainder is actually 4. Modulo 7. So if we divide uh, 100,000 by 7, the remainder is actually 5. Modulo 7. So whereas if we divide 1 million by 7, the remainder is now 1. Modulo 7. Notice that the least exponent, E, is 6. So that will give us a remainder of 1 modulo 7. And it is in the 8th remainder, which is 1. Again, 10 raised to 10 is congruent to 1 modulo 11. But also, 10 squared is congruent to 1 modulo 11. So that 1 over 11 repeats after 2 digits. In fact, 1 over 11, as we have shown, is 0 0.09009. 0 0 Continuing for higher primes, although 10 raised to 12 is congruent to 1 modulo 13, the lowest exponent for which the congruence hold is 6. So this is also true for 10 raised to 6 is congruent to 1 modulo 13. Notice that 6 is actually a divisor of 13 minus 1. So 6 is, is a divisor of 12. And 1 over 13 repeats after 6 decimal places. That is, 1 over 13 is 0 0.07, 6 times 2, 3 at infinitum. For the prime 17, it is necessary to raise 10 to the 16th power. 
before the remainder 1 is reached. That is 10 raised to 16 is congruent to 1 modulo 17. 10 is called primitive root of 17 and 1 over 17 1 over 17 is equal to 0 0.058823529411764747 ad infinito. Then the cycle repeats starting with 0. 10 is a primitive root of 19 also. And 1 over 19 therefore has 18 places of decimals in one period. I will show on table 1 the least exponent e for which 10 raised to e leaves a remainder of 1 when divided by the prime p and therefore indicates the number of decimal places in one cycle of 1 over p. Just allow me to write the table. So, on this table 1, you will see all those prime p from 3 to 97 with the corresponding exponent e. And uh, notice that the exponent tells us the number of periods in the decimal representation of that 1 over p. It is interesting to note that of the 23 add prime between 1 to 100, 10 is a primitive root of only 9 of them. I will indicate which one of them. So it's 7, 17, 19, 61 and finally 97 the greatest prime less than 100 is 97 and it so happens that 10 is a primitive root of 97 consequently 1 over 97 must be carried to 96 places of decimals before the cycle repeats another thing since p is a prime and add p minus 1 and add p minus 1 is even and the p minus 1 decimal places in one period and 10 is a primitive root can therefore be divided into two equal parts it will be noticed that the corresponding digit in the two parts always add to 9 consequently if we have half the period we can write the digits of the second half merely by subtracting from 9 those already found. Let's go back to 1 over 7. We know that the first four digits is 1, 4, 1, 4, 2. So to get the, the fourth digit, uh, 9 minus 1 is 8. 
to get the fifth digit, nine minus four is five. To get the sixth digit, nine minus two is seven. For a convenient small remainder occurring in the division, as many more digits as have already been found can be written down immediately by multiplying what has already been found by that remainder. For example, since 10 is a primitive root of 97, the period 1 over 97 has 96 place, has 96 places. Starting to calculate this by ordinary division, we have 1 over 97. The remainder is 5 over 97. This one could be done using a calculator. The remainder 5 over 97 expressed decimally is 5 times as large as 1 over 97. And the number represented by the next 11 digits is 5 times as large as the number represented by the first 11. Or, and also, is the due remainder. The number is again a convenient multiple because to multiply by 25, we merely mul uh, multiply by 100. That is, we move two decimal places to the right and divided by four. Doing this to the 22nd digit number already found, we have which after dividing by 4 gives the next 22 places with a remainder of 25 times 25 equals to 625 but So we add 6 to the previous result, writing 81 instead of 75 in the last two places and proceeding with the remainder 43. The next four digit by actual division of 43 by 97 are And since after 48 places or half period corresponding digits add to 9, so we can easily obtain the whole period of 96 digits, having actually divided for only 15 of them. The whole period is... So notice that this is the first 48 digit. So we can just correspondingly subtract each of this digit to 9 to get the last 46 digits. Doing that, we will have, so this is the first 46. The last 46 digit would, would have
And then, it starts all over again. So this is how we can show the relation of fraction to Fermat's theorem to primitive groups. So let's call this cycling to infinity. That's all. Thank you, Sir Ronald Morocco and Dr. Deo, our real analysis teacher.